2022 has been overall a hot and dry year for Central Texas. We've endured unrelenting heat, which has set or broken many records and extremely dry conditions to boot. We continue to feel the effects from the heat and the lack of rain. In this week's episode of Degrees of Science, we talked to Aaron O'Connor, Program Specialist 3, and Emily Wall, Chief Operating Officer, both for the Forest Resource Protection Division of Texas A&M Forest Services. From responding to wildfires to the ongoing recovery, this organization strives to protect Texas from wildfires and other types of disasters. I want to welcome you both ladies. I know this has been an extremely hot and dry year, like we just said, for Texas. Can you tell me a little bit more about this season as a whole? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, thanks so much for having us to, to talk about this today. Um, so 2022 has been a very busy year. Um, it's certainly one of the most significant wildfire seasons that we've had in the state of Texas, um, definitely since 2011, which I think um, most Texans remember, especially if they were living here. Um, all year, the number of wildfire responses and acres burned was above normal. Um, so we were just at an elevated pace all year. Um, and it's actually something that kind of set up and started in 2021. So during the summer of 2021, we received a significant amount of rainfall, um, which caused growth of our grasses and forbs across the state and so then when we had the freeze come the winter of 2021 into the new year um, that created a catalyst for our winter spring fire season um, and with underlying droughts and just really intense conditions this year with drying and hot temperatures and winds and frontal passages, um, it just created an, an environment that was conducive to wildfire activity um, and we just saw continued activity throughout the entire year. Yeah, you mentioned you saw just abnormally busy season. Tell us a little bit more about the process that you guys undergo when you have multiple fires or large fires that you have to contain immediately. Kind of that's a lot of coordination, I know, with you guys, too. What does that process look like overall? Yeah, so in the state of Texas, we use what's called um, a tiered approach to wildfire response. So our local fire departments and our counties, they are the first responders. Um, and then state response, so Texas and Forest Service, we are requested to assist as wildfires or conditions exceed those local capabilities or if they have a need for um, certain equipment or just increased um, personnel, um, more firefighters. Um, so Texas and Forest Service we're the lead agency for wildfire response in the state, and we maintain a network of strategically placed firefighters and equipment um, so that we can respond quicker to those requests for assistance anywhere in the state. Um, and then on top of that, once the statewide complexity increases, um, we as a state agency have the ability to bring in wildland firefighters from across the nation um, that they will they will work um, under the state's jurisdiction to respond across the state as well. So they're kind of like a, an additional arm to our response. Um, so this year we had about more than 4,400 um, wildland firefighters from other states. We had actually from 47 states and the District of Columbia as well as Puerto Rico here in Texas. And then an additional resource that we use this year is called the Texas Interstate Fire Mutual Aid System, so TIFMIS. Um, these are Texas firefighters that will mobilize as a state resource, so kind of surge capacity. And we had almost 2,000 TIFMAS firefighters supporting response this year. So just an immense amount of people. Um, as you mentioned, a lot of coordination. Um, so we, again, using our strategically placement of people, re um, equipment, resources, and just making sure that we're all communicating and having that same operational picture. Yeah, that is a lot of people, a lot of resources, and like you said, a lot of coordination. Um, and I know we had talked a little bit before, but I think it's so interesting that you guys have all those resources and you actually use different types of methods to fight wildfires, sometimes outside of water. Can you guys tell us a little bit about that process that you undergo when you're coordinating all these people and these resources and fighting these fires? Um, yeah, one of the tools that we use, um, lots of times, you know, the state as large as Texas will bring in aircraft. Um, aircraft is a great tool for wildfire suppression, um, especially for a state as large as ours. Um, and that can look like 
a lot of different types of aircraft. That can be everything from, you know, a large air tanker, which are the large planes you see that come in with um, a lead plane and then they'll drop retardant on a fire. Um, we also use helicopters and then um, something called uh, fire bosses, which are the ones that can actually go down and scoop water out of lakes or um, water sources. And so, you know, firecraft or aircraft is um, a great thing, a great tool for us to use to fight wildfires, but um, it doesn't, you know, always suppress every fire out there. Right. So, so in addition to the aviation, again, it's a great resource, but it's not going to completely put out a fire. So we use a variety of tools um, to ensure that our wildfires are contained quickly and put out quickly. Um, so we have obviously firefighters boots on the ground and we use a lot of equipment, particularly like heavy equipment, so bulldozers, motor graders, and then we also have engines. So in general, wildfires need three things um, to sustain, sustain themselves. They need a heat source, they need a fuel or like vegetation, and they need oxygen. And so what we do, because our wildfires are kind of out in the middle of nowhere or you know, removed from communities, we work to remove one of those three things. So in using um, the bulldozers or that heavy equipment, we can remove the vegetation. And so we create uh, fire breaks or containment lines around a fire. Um, and once the fire hits those containment lines, which is down to that bare mineral soil, there's no more fuel for it to burn. Um, engines, we have a limited um, amount of water that we carry in our engines, um, typically used to kind of follow behind the heavy equipment to do like what we call mop up or um, just ensuring that some of those hot spots that are near those containment lines are put out. So they're removing the heat source. Um, and then we also do what is called or what we call referred to as um, a tactical firing operation. So this is simply fighting fire with fire. Um, our firefighters will use fire, put fire on the ground, and if we use, if we put fire by those containment lines in between the containment line and the active fire, so like the, the main fire that we are there to suppress and contain, um, those two fires will compete for oxygen as well as fuel and the other resources, and they will move towards each other and essentially put itself out in that location. Um, so that's a really good way, a really good tool for us to fight the fire when we're kind of out removed from communities. And it also just ensures that that containment line is going to hold if there's a wind event or, um, you know, if anything happens, we can make sure that fire doesn't cross that line there. I think that's so cool. You know, you don't always think about fighting fire with fire. You think about, oh, what's the opposite of fire? Water. That's what I need. But that's a very limited resource. Um, so I think it's a, just amazing all the different techniques and tools that you guys get to use in that area at your disposal as well. And I, I hear that term a lot, you know, the fire is contained. Um, and I know that's not completely put out all the way. What is that kind of your process and that like containing the fire before it gets put out all the way? Yeah, so we we use right contain, control, suppress, put out. We use a lot of terms, um, but so basically, containment is a measure of how much containment line or fire line is around a fire, but also it's a reflection of how secure that line is. Mm -hmm. So we might have containment lines or a perimeter put in around a fire like very quickly, but our percentage might, like we might still report 20% contained. And that's basically because they're working to improve, widen, secure that containment line, because before we call a fire 100% contained, we wanna make sure that nothing is gonna move across that line. We're not going to have any spots over the line. Um, so we, we're very cautious in increasing that containment. Um, but so that's kind of what that means. And so then once we call it 100% contained, it still doesn't mean that the fire is out. We might have pockets of vegetation that are interior to those containment lines that continue to burn. Um, you might see smoldering. Um, the fire could also just reignite if there's vegetation that hasn't been burned. Um, so we'll monitor and patrol fires for a while. Um, and so after, you know, we feel confident that our lines are going to hold, then we'll put the fire in a control status. Um, and then after a few days um, of monitoring, patrolling, um, then we would officially declare a fire out. And that's typically the local unit that has that um, authority to do that. Very cool. That's definitely a process. And I know, you know, overall, I feel like we've seen just more and more news about wildfires and just, just wildfires just out of control. Um, do you think the wildfire conditions have gotten worse overall? 
Um, you know, I think um, just in Texas, we've seen a couple of things that could affect um, wildfires. You know, we've seen population increases, uh, fluctuating weather patterns, uh, changes in land use. You know, most of the land across the state used to be used for ag uses, and now you see more people moving into the state, so it's more urbanized. And um, currently about... Um, 86% of wildfires burn within two miles of a community. So we're seeing more impactful wildfires because they're burning so much closer to um, communities and cities. So. so this has historically been a male dominated field and I'm talking to two beautiful ladies here. Tell me a little bit more about what the female representation is like in your field and an effort to increase uh, female participation. Yeah, sure. So Texas and Forest Service, our leadership really uh, seeks to increase diversity across the wildland firefighting profession. Um, you know, according to the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association, um, women represent less than 8% of all U.S. firefighters. Um, you know, even in our own agency in Texas and Forest Service, um, there are very few women in leadership positions, so we're um, always looking to increase um, diversity just across our agency as a whole. Um, you know, one of those ways that we've tried to do that is uh, an event that we recently hosted called Sisters in Fire. Um, and it's a, an event that's aimed at uh, youth that are age uh, 12 to 17 to kind of teach them a little bit about the different tools, um, you know, dozers, um, equipment, everything you use, as well as the wildland firefighting culture. Um, there's a lot of agencies involved in putting that on. And so it not only um, helps, you know, um, the young women to learn about the culture, but it also helps the folks in our different agencies come together, put something on, you know, work on those partnerships, uh, much like we would uh, on a real wildfire. You know, those are a lot of the same agencies that we'd be responding with. Well, thank you both so much for what you do. I know it's so important to, to see um, different people seeing themselves being represented in different types of fields. And so all the work that you guys are doing, I just want to say thank you so much. We just got through the long, hot, dry summer. We're already dry going into fall. Can you guys tell us a little bit more about what you kind of see happening for the rest of the year, maybe even beyond? Yeah, um, so the forecast is showing that we anticipate the next few months to be um, warmer than normal and to have um, minimal precipitation. So we're anticipating that we're going to be seeing wildfire activity um, through the end of the year, perhaps into the new year, especially when we start to get those freezes again. Um, we should get some moisture that should hopefully kind of keep things, um, you know, a little damp, a little, a little slower pace than we saw maybe earlier this year. Mm -hmm. um, but that wildfire activity is there. Um, so we definitely really need everybody's help just to be cautious as we move into these months. Um, I think, right, it's easy to kind of get complacent when yeah. we're not in that full out mode like we were this summer. Yeah, and what are some things that we can do to help fight the wildfires, help to prevent the wildfires as we get into this, like you said, more dry weather as we go towards the end of the year and towards the new year too. Right, so um, Texas and Forest Service, we, we encourage everybody to be aware of what's going on. Check your weather forecasts. Um, you know, if it's warm, if it's dry, if you haven't had rainfall in your area, um, maybe postpone any activities, like if you're burning your debris or anything that can cause a spark, um, just wait a couple days until things maybe get a little bit better. Um, we encourage everybody to check for burn bans. Those are really important to um, follow and those are put on by the county, so your county should have information. We also post um, a daily map on our website that um, gets updated as things are reported to us, so you can check there. But um, checking for burn bans, any other burning restrictions, um, watching your conditions, and then just being really mindful of activities that can cause a spark. Um, it's usually the things that we don't always think about um, that can create a wildfire or an ignition source. Um, and if you are going to be doing anything outdoors, just just being cautious, having a water source nearby, maybe clearing that vegetation or any other hazards from the area so that you're less likely to have uh, an ignition that grows into wildfire and escapes from um, your area. 
Absolutely. A lot of great advice from Aaron and Emily and a lot of great information on what you guys do on a daily basis. And we definitely want to thank you guys for all the efforts you do to keep us safe from wildfires and other disasters as well. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks everybody for tuning in to this week's episodes of Degrees of Science. We'll see you next week.